we're in the southern part of New Jersey. We have two towns that are seven miles apart. Cherry Hill, pretty affluent, two apple stores. Camden, one of the most disadvantaged cities in the, in the country, they're about seven miles apart. Their life expectancy difference is about 16 years. Telehealth adoption in Camden, really low. Why is that? By physically coming to one of our physical centers, there's a safety component. There's a, there's a history of, I, I know I can come here, I'll get those services. So how then do we bring those tools that are readily adopted in perhaps a Cherry Hill and amend them or adopt them to meet the needs where appropriate of a different culture, a different community, can't assume have to go in front lines and talk. Welcome to another Meeting of the Minds session coming from you live at Health 2022. It's an innovation related conference, but when we think about innovation, we tend to limit that to what kinds of technologies are coming out, what, uh, what, uh, what's going on in the world of code and tech and everything like that. But it's been really interesting to see almost 20% of these uh, sessions focusing on things like health equity and a lot of uh, uh, strategic conversations br uh, being brought in. Uh, because a, a, a big part of this, a, a big part of this focus is that the tech shouldn't lead the strategy, is that we should be thinking about what our patients need, what our markets need, uh, about our, our, our overall models, and then using the tech to find and fill in those gaps. So you know, we, we don't want tech leading the cart. So who better to have that kind of discussion than a chief digital transformation officer? Uh, we're going into the uh, healthcare provider space right now with uh, Tarun Kapoor, uh, Chief Digital Transformation Officer at Virtua Health. So Virtua Health is a uh, is a five hospital system. Yeah, five five acute care hospitals. Um, about you know two billion dollar two point three billion dollars in annual revenues across the board. You know, thousand beds across all of that. But yeah, it, it's it's a. I mean, we've had a transformation ourselves over the last ten years of mm -hmm. uh, being predominantly in in inpatient health system. Now we're actually majority of our revenues are coming in through the outpatient environment. Yeah. So yeah, we're an integrated delivery network. Yes, we have hospitals. We have way more than that. Fantastic. So we want to dig uh, dig deeper into that. You you see the scale uh, that they're operating in, and I th I think that there's a lot of people that are a lot of health systems that are that are in that scale and that size category, and we're seeing uh, more and more chief digital officer, chief digital transformation officer, even if that's not a role within your health system, even if that's something that's just being newly investigated. I want you to be able to come away with this with uh, uh, with an idea on. If there, are, if there are technical innovations that, that you're excited about that might have an impact on your patients, uh, the, the kind of thinking that Tarun does to make sure that there's a strategic alignment, make sure that uh, there, there's buy-in from, from, from other uh, members of leadership, and understand how to uh, make the, the right kind of impact. Does that sound like a fun conversation to have, Tarun? Uh, I live and breathe this conversation every day, so let's do it. All right, let's dig into it. Uh, so re let's get started, uh, Tarun. I, I, I like... I want to give, give you a chance to, to, to give your background. Uh, we're talking about a transformation from um, uh, he, uh, you're an internist in your, uh, uh, in, in your clinical practice and have transitioned into this digital leadership role. What I love about talking to clinicians is um, people that have had the, the opportunity to work directly one-on-one -on -one with patients, when you get to these executive levels and when you get to uh, these you know, systems where a whole lot of what you see is on data and dashboards rather than those one-on-one -on -one relationships, I think that a lot of people have the tendency to forget all the way back down to, to who this is most impactful. So when I hear about a clinician moving into this leadership position, moving into this uh, role that, that, that spans that nurturing relationship and scales it, I'd, I'd really love for you to just share your background on why, uh, on your, on, on what your mission is and why you uh, transitioned from uh, clinical to digital. You know, Chris, I would love to say it was a very deliberate, uh, thought out process. And like most of my career, wherever you go, there you are. So, you know, I actually, so to your point, I'm an internal medicine trained physician. I was, I'm a hospitalist at its core. I was going to be a gastroenterologist. And then I came to the profound realization that I, I really don't like abdominal pain all that much. So I, I took the best bet I could and I bet it on myself and I joined a startup and that was my first foray into, but it was a startup providing clinical care. Mm -hmm. It was the advent of the hospital's uh, movement, which 
I think for my my journey was really helpful because again it was transform that was transformation at the time right digital wasn't really a big thing in the early 2000s uh, but hospital medicine was a transformation changing what we do today in terms of splitting your primary care doctor no longer coming to the hospital turning your care over to a dedicated specialist in the hospital that was a transformation at the time lather rinse repeat is the same pattern is now they're just different tools at the end of the day, transformation has to be, to my mind, innovation without adoption is experimentation. Innovation with an adoption, then you have a transfer transformation. So the adoption is the hard part. Right? The innovation, the experimentation, that's fun. That's what conferences are like this about. But when you go back to your home base, that's where the work begins. That, that and I, I love the way that's worded because yeah we're we're at a conference that's focused on a bunch of these technologies but you're really focused on this adoption piece. Could you tell me about? Uh, could, could you dig a little bit deeper into uh, what the gap is when people are overly focused on tech but miss the the adoption picture? Yes, I I have insights from being on the floors. I still round with the residents, and and the number one reason I round with the residents, yes, certainly there's a patient contact, but I also get to see the impact of some of my decisions digitally on the frontline workflow. And I've said to the residents like, oh, who came up with this idea? It's like you did. It's like, oh, that was a terrible idea. I had no idea that this was gonna be the downstream impact. Without, so we can think about as much as like, okay, cerebral whiteboard, love to whiteboard. But when things go into translation, things go awry. And so then you have to back off and say, well, it was a great idea on paper or mm -hmm. great on Visio. Visio does not equivalent is not equivalent to real life, and so you have to get and see what is what is the the workflow that you've created. Software has been understanding this agile ma mindset for for decades. Healthcare still classic waterfall. We design everything perfectly on paper, mm -hmm. and then we implement it, only to find out we never designed it right the first time because we're fallible. We're humans, and we don't understand consumers. From their viewpoint always so that that is that does sound like a major hurdle to uh discuss especially uh, correct me if i'm wrong but a, a lot of times maybe a project might scope up into multiple years before it uh gets put into the wild and then it, it fails to adopt and these are possible things that like of, of course there, there's lots of staff investment and time investment but also damaging to the careers of the people that were involved right so yeah certainly i mean you know there, there's this you know saying no, no one ever got fired for hiring IBM, right, back in the day, because you brought in an external consultant, well, IBM told me to do this. So then you say, well, I, I'm going to continue to bring external help in versus just experimenting yourself. I think the other thing that makes it especially difficult in healthcare is this concept of very appropriately so from the Hippocratic Oath, primum non necessary, which is Latin for first of all, do no harm. You know, not doing harm is crucial to patient care. But not doing harm also can be, you know, could slow down innovation. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do in our team is we say, we will innovate. It will not be perfect, but it will always be safe. Safe is the absolute, whatever we experiment with must be safe. But if it doesn't work properly, it was still safe. We just learned something new. So instead of trying to spin up a new service line in six months, nine months, we try to spin it up in four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Instead of planning to see... 200, 300 people, let's plan and see five. What do we learn? And after we do a couple iterations of this, we finally realize, oh, that's the problem. And you don't know the problem until you try to solve it. And then you realize four or five times, four or five iterations into it, oh, that's the problem I'm trying to figure out. So about two decades ago, uh, a lot of technology companies, a lot of hacker mentality was around move quickly and break things. And um, like we can understand where the emotion of that was coming from, but we don't want to break things in healthcare. So this this focus that you're you're outlining strikes a balance with that. Yeah, yeah, and you have to understand you what is what's going to slow down innovation, especially in healthcare. And you know, to me, it's fear. And you have to understand that there are two sets of consumers in healthcare, which is very unusual compared to most other retail and and other you know, financial services. Perhaps we have the patient consumer. And we have the clinician consumer. And all too often, we innovate for one at the expense of the other. Mm -hmm. Where, if, if I'm giving something that's better to the patient consumer, 
am I asking, am I making the life harder on our clinician consumer? Especially coming out, we knew, our clinicians were burnt out prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid now what, what's happening to them, right? We know nurses are, are stating, for the most part, 35, 40% are saying we're, they're going to leave the workforce by the end of the year. And those are devastating numbers. So we need to continue to innovate on the, on the consumer front for the patient, but it can't be at the expense of the clinician. If we can find those win-wins or find a compromise, this is pretty good for the patient consumer and actually makes the life better for a clinician consumer both, those get viral adoption. Let, so I, I want to uh, dig into that if, if that's okay with you. I, I'm, I'm really cool, uh, really interested in the anatomy of a successful innovation, finding that win-win, the compromise, and even some of the pitfalls uh, in that process. There's, there's things that have to be sacrificed for, for, for the greater good. So is there a, a particular innovation that uh, you, you'd like to point to or that you're, you're, you're proud of and, and would like to give us the story behind it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to say it was this super fancy um, automation, artificial intelligence. Uh, let, let's just talk about something really basic online scheduling. The technology was ready. The consumer was ready, right? The patient said, I know how to schedule myself for this. I, I don't mind scheduling myself for that. For, you know, I can get a table at a restaurant. I'm feeling pretty comfortable. I can do it for my clinician. Not everyone wants to do that way. Some people still want to call. But the, where we were missing, the missing link was the operator. The clinicians were scared. So when we had to stop and sit down with the clinicians, what worries you the most? And I think this is one of the, I learned this question from uh, Dr. Steve Beeson from Practicing Excellence. One of the most powerful questions you can ask a patient or an operator, what about this gives you the greatest hesitancy? What worries you the most about this? When we talk to our clinicians about what worries you the most about opening your schedule to online scheduling, they were saying, patient may book the wrong type of appointment. Then I had to play catch up for the rest of the day and I'm already spending two hours at home every night on documentation. So we work with them at the elbow, it's, yeah, one at a time sometimes. And that's the, you know, these slow ideas. You want, everyone wants everything to go viral. When it does, it's wonderful, but by definition, most things don't. Mm -hmm. Most things just require at the elbow transformation. So we went almost one by one with our clinicians, help us understand it, where we do this, we do a little bit, see, look, it didn't work, it didn't break anything. Let's go a little bit more. Let's go a little bit more. The numbers now speak for themselves. When at Virtua in 2020, we did 16,000 online scheduled appointments for the year. Last month, we did 21,000 for the month. So that's viral adoption. It took two years, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the viral part. It was the hard work at the elbow. That's that, you know, to, to me, that's a transformation. That's one of the, the prime examples, of the many overnight successes that actually took years in the making. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so there's a bunch of those, and and I think that uh, what you've est you've established here by focusing on technological readiness, then looking at consumer readiness, then looking at cultural uh, uh, readiness among the operators, uh, what else would you put into a rubric that people should be using to, uh, to 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 look at these innovative projects? And maybe maybe we can use that as an example of we're at health right now, we're seeing all kinds of in all kinds of innovations. What uh, what's your mental model? in like identifying new innovations to pursue? What's, what, what, what's, what does it take yeah. to get you excited about something? And, and, and I think that's exactly the rubric I use, right? And then and I I'm love to refine it. Maybe there's a fourth dimension that has to come in there as well. And, you know, and that's something we can learn from each other over time. So the other thing I look at is, okay, if only one of the three dimensions is ready, I step away, we're just not there yet. I've seen some stuff here from a technology perspective very interesting can't be there's a difference between bleeding edge and cutting edge mm -hmm. my team is not ready for bleeding edge we had other things we had to fix cutting edge is good you don't want to necessarily and, and actually you know what sometimes it's not it's not always bad to be a laggard on some things too you cannot be mm -hmm. cutting edge on everything all right if everything's a priority then nothing's a priority the word priority there's no such plural priority means one so what is the one? All right, so we compromise and we mean we have two or three priorities. You cannot have 15 priorities. It's just not feasible. If, so if it's only one of the dimensions is ready, we're just not there yet, in the parking lot, we'll come back. If two of the dimensions are overlapping, then start thinking about what do we need to do to get the third ready? 
So maybe in some cases, the operator's ready, the technology's ready, but the consumer's not. All right, well, is this something we can educate the consumer on to make them more aware of it? So that's a marketing outreach, you know, you know uh, those pieces. Some, I gave the online scheduling example, that was an operator not ready. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if the consumer and the operator is ready and the technology isn't there, then I start looking for some vendors at the, on the floor to say, hey, this is what I'm trying to figure out. Do you want to co-develop together? So that's, that's how we try to approach it. And we got projects in all three of those dimensions working. And every once in a while, something comes up where all three are lined up, and then you just go. So Excellent. So I, I, I want to dig into that. I want to throw an analogy out there. But it, it feels like some of the things when you're talking about bleeding edge, you're talking about a concept car. Like the, the, they have really exciting looking technology and everything like that, but it hasn't uh, been tested you, uh, and, and uh, deigned for practical use. Bleeding Edge is moving, uh, moving more into, into that. And then like you, 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 uh, the further you go, the further you get out to the laggard category, but it's, it's kind of like what's, what's actually available for use versus what's just completely new that a neophile would be approaching. You know, there, there's a lot of pull out there. There's a lot of solutions out there looking for problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things that I try to do from my world is to say, I can validate this is a legitimate problem that we're ready to solve for. You know, consumer, and, and so I think having the patience to say no, mm -hmm. no is really hard. Great strategy is not about what you're doing. Great strategy is about what you're not doing, intentionally not doing. You know, Steve Jobs said all the time, I come across these brilliant ideas that I say no to. Having the fortitude to say no is absolutely crucial. Then let, let's talk about your, uh, like we, we have this rubric where you're, you're examining for cultural readiness and tech readiness and, and all of the above, consumer readiness. I, I'm, I'm curious if there are uh, technologies that, that maybe you've been tracking for a while and are now entering that radar in, in, into things that you'd be considering in the next year, two years, three years, just what, 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 what is coming down the pipe that uh, you think it would, would be a miss if, if uh, Virtual wasn't considering? One of the, you know, I think one of the um, classic examples, in, in, in my opinion, is where we've been missing the boat a little bit is the system of record, your classic EMR. Great stuff you can do inside of your EMR, but now we're getting to the system of engagement. How do you get a patient to maintain their behavior outside of your clinical walls or whether it's a telemedicine visit, you know, virtual clinical walls or actual clinical walls, because that's where the change happens in mm -hmm. their life. If they're only maintaining changes in their behavior 0.01% of the time when they're interacting with you, how do we engage folks how to do that? There's lots of great tools out here, but how many of them are truly delivering a return on investment? And I think one of the ways we've been trying to think about it is it's not an either or. If we can find an opportunity where we can get engagement on their own, but simultaneously it integrates when they interact with the traditional health system, that's the win. So the augmentation of the clinician provider, there was you know, a big debate on one of the floors yesterday is like is telehealth you know, on the A-list. Well, actually, if you look at the data, the answer is, in my opinion, no. You got only about 10 to 12 percent or maybe 15 percent at the most of people in the United States engaging in telehealth. Telehealth is not the solution that everyone thought it was going to be. The adoption's not there. Why is that? Because the consumer is telling the patient consumer is telling us, I still need in person for certain things or I want in person for certain things. So if I'm going to say I'm only going to give you a digital only solution. Mm, that may not work. If you say, I'm only going to give you an analog or in-person solution, that's not always ideally convenient. Where can we add the two? You know, I think about Disney has nailed this. I have a nine-year-old. <laughs> Disney's Plus is on the television all the time. We're watching movies and all that stuff. We've still gone to Disney World. Why? Because my wife and I want to see the look on his face when he looks at the ginormous mouse. Mm -hmm. right. That's still an analog experience. So I start my journey for digital with Disney before. Book on my uh, fast passes. I, you know, we do the superhero you know, breakfast and all of that. That's all booked ahead of time. Then we go there. We experience the rides analog. right? We go on the 
whatever roller coaster. And then we finish our digital journey, digital. The pictures start coming. And then, oh, hey, let's watch this movie. You remember we did the ride. That's what healthcare has to drive as well. It's not an either or of only digital, only analog. How do we integrate the two? And then I think the final piece, which we're possibly missing right now, is how do we teach our clinicians how to use these tools? You ask me what is more important, a stethoscope or a digital tool? If you don't know how to use digital tools properly, you're probably less effective than someone who's purely animal. I mean, who's integrated. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some of the things that we think through. We're missing the boat on teaching our clinicians how to use these tools. And that's one of the things I think there's a great opportunity. Okay, well, uh, I, I think that covered some significant ground, a lot that connected back to the adoption piece that you were talking about at the very, uh, very beginning. Um, so and it, it sounds like a, a good part of that rubric is uh, to test consumer adoption, see what's actually being adopted, see what those uh, see what those patterns are. And uh, without delving into a, a bunch of extensive market research yourself on uh, some some new technology, you start getting signal on what people might be ready, what people are raising their hands that they want in their healthcare experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the other area that we, you know, you, you raised earlier on, and I think, you know, is an area of, um, that we need to spend more time on is also then from the equity perspective. And I, I, I do think it, that falls into the patient consumer bucket. Getting really smart of understanding the problem for one group is gonna be very different from the problem for another. So I'll give an example of telehealth. We're in the Southern part of New Jersey. We have two towns that are seven miles apart. Cherry Hill, pretty affluent, two Apple stores, two Apple stores. Wow. Camden, one of the most disadvantaged cities in the, in the country, they're about seven miles apart. Their life expectancy difference is about 16 years. Enormous, just zip code, seven miles apart, 16 years life expectancy difference. Telehealth adoption in Camden, really low. Why is that? Our hypothesis is it's not just Wi-Fi. By physically coming to one of our physical centers, there's a safety component. There's a, there's a history of, I, I know I can come here, I'll get those services. So how then do we bring those tools that are readily adopted in perhaps a Cherry Hill and amend them or adopt them to meet the needs where appropriate of a different culture, a different community, a different you know, a, a different perhaps use case. So I, I think being really sensitive to that but it's the same set of questions. I have to ask, why is it that you want to come here physically and not necessarily do a telemedicine visit? Can't assume. Have to go in front lines and talk. You know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually heard uh, in a presentation yesterday uh, something that really st uh, struck me was that access isn't enough. Like just by uh, having services available, how do you know that people are going to trust enough to use or adopt, like you said earlier, even if you have the access there, what you're talking about is how do we drive trust enough to use that telehealth service versus the in-person visit? Yeah, because you're talking access that is potentially convenient to me on the operator side, but it may not be convenient. Think of open table. If open table said, hey, this restaurant's got tons of access, but it's, you know, it's a breakfast joint and the access is available between 11, uh, sorry, 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., that's not when people want to have breakfast. Right. So, you know, that's, you know, so you got you got to have the right type of access relative to what people are trying to match. So we've covered the spectrum in terms of adoption, rubrics for innovation uh, and uh, technologies and like how, how you're how you're looking at the market as a whole. I, I'm curious uh, if there was one thing. This is what we ask, ask of everyone. I'm really curious to hear your answer. Uh, but if there is one thing that you could change about how healthcare is delivered, what would that be? can't believe I'm saying this. I don't think medicine is all that complex. Yet at the same time, it's remarkably complex when you start getting into genomes and proteonomics. If we could do a better job and start better and, and really come back to what is the problem we're trying to solve? You know, I, I think about online scheduling. We, by, all by all means, by all metrics, we've been extraordinarily successful at online scheduling. Is that really the problem that we're trying to solve? Is, there, is it the right problem? 
is a patient saying to us, I really need a doctor's appointment? Or is the real problem is I want my ailment to go away? Because if you ask the question differently, then maybe online scheduling with a doctor's office is not me, really the solution you should be working on. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, where we're pivoting now is to say, you know what, instead of you having to pick out which doctor you want to go see, what if we get you set up with a headache clinic? You want your headache to go away. Do you necessarily care which doctor you see? Or you want to like, I want to see, get me in, and then we'll figure it out once I'm there, which, who I should be seeing. How do you make, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? I think we need to take a step back and really think more about it. I think we've kind of glanced over and said, we're just going to continue to feed the beast. Mm -hmm. I, I think there may be an opportunity to, to readjust that. The point that you just made, honestly, it, it, it works at the strategic level, like, like the, the conversation that we had about uh, not choosing, choosing technology solutions before a strategy is established. It even works in conversation where people are talking over each other because they're not talking about the same thing. So I'm, I'm just really excited that, that, that you, you brought that kind of question uh, to, the, to the foray is like a, a lot of teams can better come together if they're in agreement on what the problem they're trying to solve is. We, we spend so much time working on the solution and we spend way too little time trying to understand the problem. And I, you know, I, I, there's a quote, I, I think it's anonymous. Yeah, I don't, and I apologize if whoever came up with it, you know, knowledge is knowing the right answer. Wisdom is knowing the right question. Beautiful. For, for the folks that have uh, sat with us, uh, we, we're really thankful. Uh, glad to hear from yet another excellent executive doing uh, great things on Meeting of the Minds. And if you want to keep track of these conversations, find out more and learn more, uh, hop on our landing page, and we will make sure that you are in the know.